If you haven't done so yet, please make sure that you pause the video and reread the problem before listening on. We have two pulses being sent along a string, and the one pulse starts at the origin, and the other pulse starts at the length of the string, which is 10 meters. And we need to first calculate the velocity, or actually the speed, of these two waves. It's going to turn out to be useful information for us later. Now, the speed of a wave on a string under tension is governed by the following equation. We have the tension in the string, which is given to us right there, divided by the mass per unit length. We're actually going to have to calculate that mass per unit length, and then we take the square root of it. So let's talk about that mass per unit length. That's symbolized by the Greek letter mu. And all you need to do is take the mass of the string and then divide it by the length of the string. Now, the mass of the string is given, but it's given in grams. So just make sure you divide that by 1,000 to get it into kilograms. So we would have 0.1 kilograms for the mass of the string divided by the length of the string. Once again, the length of the string is just 10 meters. We know that because that second pulse begins at the other end of the string, which is located at x is equal to 10 meters. So the actual length of the string is 10 meters. So we calculate that and we would get 0 0.01 kilograms per meter. We're going to be plugging that value in for mu and then the 250 newtons in for tau. And when we simplify that, we get a speed of approximately 158 meters per second. So both pulses are traveling with that same speed and eventually they're going to meet with each other, we have to figure out at what position x do the pulses meet. So let's do that next. So here is a picture representing the motion of the pulses. We can see that the one pulse begins at x equals zero, and then the other pulse begins at the complete length of the string x equals l. And then they sort of start traveling towards each other, and eventually they're going to meet at a common x coordinate. So for the first pulse, we've called that x coordinate x1. For the second pulse, we've called that x coordinate x2. But eventually those two values, those two x coordinates are going to be equal to each other, and we have to find what that x coordinate is. Now this is basically a kinematics type of problem. We have written one of the key equations of kinematics that you've learned earlier in this unit, and we can use that to calculate the final x-coordinate. So just to revisit that, this is the final x-coordinate, this is the initial x-coordinate, we have the initial velocity multiplied by the time, and then we have this one-half at squared. A is the acceleration, but these pulses are not accelerating. There is no additional force exerted on them once they are sent traveling along the string. So if there's no force, there's no acceleration, this last term will actually drop out. So we can simplify the equation just a little bit. For the first pulse, we're going to call that x coordinate, that final x coordinate, x sub 1. That's going to equal the initial x coordinate, which you can see from the picture is 0, plus the initial velocity, which we calculated earlier, of 158, multiplied by the time of travel. Now we can eliminate this 0 here. That's going to give, give us the expression for the x coordinate, the final x coordinate of pulse 1. Now we'll do something similar for pulse 2. We'll kind of scoot down here. For pulse 2, the initial x coordinate is actually over here at the length of the string. But the length of the string was 10 meters. So you would say 10 meters for that. Now be careful with the velocity of that second pulse. Remember, the velocity of the second pulse is going to be negative because it's traveling to the left. So you want to make sure you say minus 158. And then we also want to be careful regarding the time of travel. The second pulse is not traveling for the complete time t. It is sent 30 milliseconds after pulse 1. So we actually have to subtract the 30 milliseconds from the time because it's not traveling for that complete time. Pulse 1 is traveling for a longer period of time. So we would subtract the 30 milliseconds, divide 30 by 1,000 to get it into seconds. So we have 0.03 seconds. So eventually, these two x-coordinates, these two final x-coordinates are going to be equal. The pulses are going to end up at the same final x-coordinate right there. So we're going to take this expression for the final x-coordinate of pulse 1 and set it equal to the final x-coordinate of pulse 2. Let's scoot down the page and do that. So we have a nice simple equation here that we can solve. We're going to distribute this negative 158 first. Next, we will add 158t to both sides. Combine the like terms on the right-hand side, and then we're going to end up dividing by the 316 to solve for time. We end up with a time at which these two pulses meet. It's about 0.05 seconds. Once we have that time, we can go back to any one of our little x-coordinate equations and plug in the time. Of course, the first equation is much simpler. So we're going to take that equation, and we're going to plug in the time we just calculated. That's going to give us the x1. That's the final position of pulse 1, but that's also the final position of pulse 2. That would equally give us the value of x2. So let's go ahead and use that simpler equation and calculate x1. 
And after doing so, we get an X1 of 7.37 meters. So that would be the distance from the left end of the string at which these two pulses meet. And that indeed is the correct answer to the question.